Hello and welcome back. This is Systems, Systems Design 522, The Fundamentals of AI, um, taught at the University of Waterloo in the fall of 2023. This is Lecture 5, The Kernel Trick Part 1, SVM Redux. Why am I giving such a pretentious name to this particular lecture? Um, this might be the most important lecture in the course. Um, Partly just for those who are, you know, doing a final project in the course, um, this is like, you know, one if one of the techniques you are likely to use when whatever it is you're doing for your final project, if you if it's got some sort of categorization aspect going on, um, one of the techniques you should compare to is what we're going to talk about in this lecture. Um, so as far as the course, this is a pretty important one. Um, but also, I would say if in general you are ever wanting to use AI to do some sort of categorization of data, um, try this first, what we're going to talk about here first. Um, so that's, yeah, we'll just start with that sort of um, big caveat. Let's set expectations high for this lecture. Okay, so in the last lecture, we introduced the support vector machine. Um, this is a categorization system. If I have a bunch of data points, that's the blue dots and the red dots, um, on this graph over here, and I really want to divide, draw a line between them, such as put it into two categories. We've seen a graph like that since the very beginning, since the perceptrons in the very first lecture. The problem with the perceptron is, well, it could do any of the lines that we're dividing these things. Its only goal was just to divide the line, these categories into category A and category B, but there wasn't any sense of, well, what's the best dividing line? And for the support vector machines, the definition of best ended up being, well, give me the line, this blue line here in the middle, that gives the maximum space between the two categories. Okay, so that maximizes this margin. Um, and we did a whole bunch of math to figure out, okay, how to do that. Um, and it turned out there was a couple different forms, ways you could write this out. Um, the sort of the basic form that we started with was, hey, you want to minimize the magnitude of the weights, just because we showed that minimizing the magnitude of the weights is what maximizes the spacing. Um, but we also want to make sure that all the dots are on one side, all the blue dots are on one side of this line and the red dots are on one side of this line. So that's the lines formed by instead of omega x plus b equals zero, omega x plus b equals one and minus one. We want to get all the dots over here or over here. And so we added constraints. Um, and then we used the technique of the Lagrange multiplier in order to turn those constraints into some math with some variables. And we ended up reorganizing things and saying, hey, what this all turns down turns into is an optimization problem where we have to find these alpha values. There's an alpha value for each of these data points. For the data points that aren't right on these boundary lines, those data points, their exact value doesn't matter at all. So it turns out those alpha values go to zero. Um, for the data points on the lines, on these dividing lines, we're going to get alpha values that are um, non-zero and positive. Um, and um, it, this just turns this whole task into a constrained optimization problem, and it's a quadratic constrained optimization problem, so there's techniques out there to solve it for us. And we just throw it at a computer, and the computer gives us these alpha values, um, and we never do that by hand because there's a lot of these alpha values. There's one of these alpha values for every single data point. Fine. Okay. So that's the setup that we had. Um, and then once you've got those alphas, you can go ahead and compute omega um, just by adding up the, you know, just do this weighted sum of them, um, alpha being the values that we go and optimize for, and yi being uh, plus one for the things in one category and minus one for things in the other category. Fine. That's what we said last class. Great. That seems pretty cool. We've got an optimal dividing line. Oh, uh, terminology. Um, just in case you'll ever run into this in the future, this second form here of the task where we've sort of rewritten in terms of these sums of sums, um, this is called the dual form. Um, if you see that in terminology anywhere, so we have a primal form of the, of the question and the dual form of the question. 
they're mathematically identical, but they're just very useful for different things. Right. Um, all right, fine. So what? Um, okay, so first thing I'm going to point out is this decision rule. We can do a little bit of playing around with this decision rule. So this line that we're going to draw here, this blue line, once we've trained up our model, now when we feed in new data, we're going to feed in a new x value. We're going to do this math, and if it's greater than zero, it's in this category. If it's less than zero, it's in this category. Um, and we know that we're going to, we can compute omega by doing the sum of alpha i, y, x, i. Um, fine. So that's once we once we optimize for alpha i, we know y i and x i because that's our data points. Um, so the x sub i, that's each of these individual data points, and the i is indexing across all of these different data points. Um, fine. So that sort of makes sense. We could do that. One weird thing to point out is I don't technically have to compute omega. I could just substitute this into our decision rule and write it this way, which means this, um, and this is the dot product between two vectors here. Okay. Um, so instead of computing omega, I could just keep my support vectors around. I've got these three values. Those are the only ones I need to keep around. Everything else I can ignore because alpha i is zero for them. Um, and when I get a new data point, I could just compute the dot product with each of those, multiply it by these scalars, and add that up. And I could use that instead. Fine. I suppose you could do that. It's a bit of a waste because, I mean, this now means... So if, if I've got three support vectors, then this means I'm computing three dot products. Whereas if I had have just done that, well, I would just be computing one dot product, the dot product between my new data point and this omega thing, this weights values. So, okay, weird that you can do that, but that doesn't seem all that important. But we're going to need to keep that in mind. We don't actually have to generate omega. That's going to be useful in today's lecture. Okay, so what really, but what do we really want to address here? Um, what if our data isn't linearly separable? So here's some data. You cannot draw a line through that that perfectly separates the blue dots from the red dots. So you also can't find a line that maximally gives a highest margin. You try doing that optimization the way I laid it out, and it'll just say, hey, look, there is there, there just are no weights that satisfy those constraints. Um, at the end of last class, we pointed out a way that you can deal with this um, by adding in a sort of a cost to violate the boundary um, into the optimization task, and you can sort of set the C value. And if C is infinitely large, then it's exactly like what we were just talking about. Um, but if C is smaller than infinity, then what that's just going to act is sort of a penalty on um, exactly how bad is it for a data point to violate the boundary. So how bad is it for a blue point to be on the left side of this line, and how bad is it for a red point to be on the right side of this line. Um, so we can deal with data that's not linearly separable, and it still finds a perfectly good you know, dividing line between these, these two sets of data. But it's still a linear boundary, right? Um, it's still, like, we're still drawing a straight line. And there's no particular reason to believe that any sort of real-world data set is going to have a straight line to, to, that can separate it. And here's the example that, again, we pointed out way back in the, in the Perceptron's lecture. Um, what are you going to do here? How are you going to draw a single line dividing that up? And you, you just can't, right? Um, so what do we do instead? Well, we, what we did instead in the previous class, we said, okay, well, you don't have to just keep with X. You can define your own features. Right? And that, indeed, that's exactly when people were working with the Perceptron initially, that's exactly what they did, is they knew you don't want to feed the raw data into it. You have to take your raw data and transform it in various ways. Um, and one of the things they did is just transform it in lots of random different ways. Um, or if you know something about the task, you can go ahead and transform it in ways that are good for the task. Um, but we transform our data um, uh, into some new data, and then we can do our linear classifier in that new space. Right? And the particular thing that we pointed out with sort of 
this sort of data is one thing you could do is transform this two-dimensional space. So if I've got I've got two-dimensional data right now, x the, the the individual points have an x1 and an x2 value. Um, if I kept those two features, um, uh, we tend to use the term feature when we're saying things that are we're starting to get into. Okay, we're, we're doing some computations on our raw data. Um, well, one really in, one really easy computation on our raw data is just take the raw data. So I'm just going to have one feature be x1 and one feature be x2. But then I'm going to have a third feature, which is x1 squared plus x2 squared. And what that's going to do is that's going to give, you know, uh, so if you, if you want to imagine this um, in sort of 3D, where these blue dots are far away from you, and these red dots are closer to you, um, or vice versa, the blue dot, yeah, the blue dots be really close to you, and then the red dots sort of far going away from you into the page. Um, basically, and they're going away based on their distance from the center point. Right? That's what x1 squared plus x2 squared is going to give you. It's something that gets bigger and bigger the farther away you are from the center point. So that's why the blue dots are going to stay pretty close to you, and the red dots are going to go pretty far away. And once that happens, well, now you can just put a, sli a linear slice through that data. And we put a plane through that data that nicely separates the blue dots from the red dots. Right? That'd just be a plane that's sort of parallel to the to the screen. Um, and so that's the general trick of taking data and putting it in a higher dimensional space. And once it's in the higher dimensional space, you've got a better chance of being able to make a linear separation between our data points. So we define features in this space. Um, of course, we run into exactly this problem of, well, which features, how many of them? Again, people often just do that randomly or did sort of just choose that randomly back in the Perceptron days. Um, but if you do this transformation and I do the same, uh, and then I just do a standard SVM on it and I plot the results, I get this. Um, now, this particular diagram, we're going to see a bunch of them in this lecture, so I want to explain what the heck I'm plotting here. Um, the red dots, the blue dot, and the blue dots, great. That's um, what category they're in. Um, um, that's that's totally normal. Um, I am plotting the support vectors, so that is the vectors whose alpha values are non-zero. Uh, for the red dots, I'm plotting the support vectors in yellow. For the blue dots, I'm supporting plotting the support vectors in green. Okay, so, so they'll sort of pop out a little bit. Um, those are the points that are sort of helping define this plane. Um, and then what I'm doing for this color in the background, I'm computing that function um, omega x plus b, um, and I'm just and I'm just plotting its value. Okay? So if it's less than minus one, it's this dark red color. So for all these data points out here, omega x plus one is less than minus one. Uh, if it's greater than plus one, it's this solid blue color. And then for the points in between, we've got this sort of gradation. Um, and this white line going around the circle, if you were forced to say, okay, is it greater or less than zero, that would be this white line um, around the middle here. Okay. Um, the way I'm generating this plot is just brute force. I am just, all right, picking... 100 data points across here and 100 data points across here, so that's 10,000 data points. Taking each of those 10,000 data points, feeding them into the SVM, seeing or computing omega x plus b. Um, well, okay, so it's just taking those 10,000 data points and computing omega x plus b on them. That's that's all I have to do here. Um, that's pretty fast, ma uh, pretty fast operation to do. That gives me a value, and then I'm just plotting the colors based on that value. Okay, so nothing fancy to generate that, um, but that's what we're seeing. Our support vector can do, if, if we can define this higher dimensional space, we can still do our classification and just use exactly what we talked about last class. Cool. Um, Math-wise, what does that turn into? How do we want to sort of write, rewrite what we're talking about here? So I'm going to define phi x which is a function of x, that's the transformation. I take my raw x data and I transform it into some other set of values. Um, and we can think of that as just this big list of different functions, each of which is some function on x. So for this particular case here, I would have three functions, phi1, you know, x is a two-dimensional thing, so phi1 of x is just x1, phi2 of x is just x2, and phi3 of x is 
x1 squared plus 2x2 squared. But they can be any functions of x. Okay, so I'm going to do that transformation, and then I'm just going to do a normal SVM. So really all I have to do is replace x with phi of x in all these things. All right, fine. So, okay, I now have that. Um, and again, this is a dot product between um, these two vectors. Um, omega dot product with phi of x. I can compute omega the same way. It's just the sums of these phi of x's of each of these of the support vectors of the, the points that have non-zero alphas. Um, and I can do the same decision rule. I mean, I'm, I'm just using phi of x instead of x. Okay, fine. So what? What? Why is that helpful? Okay, so let's take a closer look at what I actually need to do. So this is the only place in all of that math that phi of x even appears. Okay. Um, I need to compute this big giant sort of sum. This is... Um, all right. And... This thing that I'm summing over ends up being the dot products between different phi's. They're sort of fine. And then when I compute the decision boundary, if I sort of combine things together and don't write it in terms of omega, again, all I have to compute is these dot products. Now that's an interesting pattern there. So I've already pointed out that we don't need to compute weights. We don't need to compute omega. But this is saying something even more. This is saying, I don't even technically have to compute the feature. I don't have to compute phi. The only thing I actually have to compute is the dot product between two phi's. And that's just a scalar. The dot product between two vectors is just a scalar. Right? So this, this there could, might be an interesting shortcut. I just, need the, I just need those dot products. Is there a shortcut, instead of taking x, transforming it with phi, and then doing a dot product between those transformed things, and then end up with a scalar, is there a way to write this dot product in some other way that just directly gives me that scalar value rather than going through this intermediate step of these big giant... Because th th this might be a big giant vector, right? I mean, even if these xi's are, if, are like five-dimensional, five maybe my transform data space is a hundred-dimensional, um, can I, you know, avoid going up to the hundred-dimensional space and doing a hundred, uh, hundred-dimensional dot product? Um, okay, so that's what we're going to look for, and we're going to start by at least showing one example that this is possible. So, one example. Let's have x be two-dimensional, so it's x one, x two, um, and Let's have phi of x, so I'm going to transform this into some other space, and it's going to be this particular other space. I'm going to take the x, x1 and square it, I'm going to take x2 and square that, and then I'm also going to take x1, multiply it by x2, and multiply it by root 2. Eh, why am I multiplying it by root 2? It's just going to scale something, it's going to make the math nicer, really it's just a scalar on the feature, so it's the same as just multiplying that feature by a constant. Um, so it doesn't really change anything much. It's not going to change much about the decision boundary. Um, but um, but at least we can sort of vaguely get a sense that, okay, maybe I, you know x1 squared and x2 squared and some combination of x1 and 2, maybe I could vaguely see that those might be interesting features to have. We'll worry about better sets of features in the future. We're using this one as sort of a, a simple example to show that the shortcut is possible. Um, so... The thing that all the math needs is the dot product between the phi's of two different x values. I'm now running into notation difficulty because I don't want to call those two different x values x1 and x2 because I'm already using x1 to mean the first element of the x vector and the x2 to be the second element of the x vector. Um, it's definitely a situation where I really should have been better about having notation indicating what things are scalars and what things are vectors. Um, in any case, for this, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, okay, let's imagine that my two points that I'm trying to do the dot product, or that I'm trying to do this computation on, instead of x1 and x2, I'm going to call them a and b. So a is consisting of the vector a1, a2, and b is the vector b1, b2. Fine. 
Um, this is the thing, this is the math that I need to compute in order to do those equations for the support vector machine. What's that look like here? Well, I just substitute that in, and this is just phi 1 squared root 2 a1 a2, a2 or not. so this phi is just, so phi of a is a1 squared root 2 a1 a2 a2 squared. And then 5b is b1 squared root 2b1, b2, b2 squared. Right? That's just, all right, fine, substitute that in. So what's the dot product actually doing for us here? Well, the dot product is multiplying these things pairwise, and then we add it all up. So let's just do that. And we're going to get a1 squared, b1 squared, plus 2, a1, b2, b1, b2, a2 squared, b2, b2 squared. Fine. Okay, that's what dot product's going to do. So what? Now hold on, can we do something to that? We can factor that, we can complete do like complete the squares or something on that, something in that ballpark, in fact complete the squares is even nicer on that because that is a square. Right, that's a1b1 one one squared plus a2b2 two two squared. And what's a1b1 one one plus a2b2? Two two? Well that's just a dot b. So what that's saying is instead of instead of taking my values, projecting them into this three-dimensional space, so computing each of these individual things on them, and then doing the dot product, I could have just taken my individual original values, done the dot product between them, and then squared the result. Okay, so this would be a faster way of if I have A and B and you know, back here, it was saying, I need to do this dot product. So instead of doing that dot product, or here, instead of doing that dot product, instead of taking my x values, projecting them in, you know, doing this phi calculation, whatever the heck it is, and then taking that result and doing the dot product between them, if I had these as my features, then my shortcut is, don't bother ever doing this math. Don't bother ever, ever generating these phi's. Just do this math. Just do a dot b squared. Okay, that's kind of cool and useful, but I mean, is this a useful set of, is this just like some weird thing that I can do for this one special case of features? Are there sort of more useful features I might be able to use? Um, so we have Okay, so this is what I just showed, is that if I have this set of features, then instead of computing the dot product between, or instead of projecting into the feature space and then computing the dot product, I could have left it in the original space and just done the dot product and then squared it. Um, so fine, I showed that that math works. Um, oh, if you're a little worried about this root two, um, you could also write it this way. This feature space would also do it. Um, so this is just, this is now four dimensions. Of course, x1, x2 is the same as x2, x1. Um, but the reason I'm writing it this way is just to show that really all we're doing here is we are just listing all possible pairwise combinations of the x's. Um, and that also indicates what would happen, so I only showed the proof for if um, a or, and b are two-dimensional. If a and b are three-dimensional, It'll be this same pattern, but it's all possible pairwise combinations. So that's going to be like uh, two to the three. That's going to be like eight items long, of which some of those eight items will be identical, and so they can be grouped together again. Um, so anyway, that's just to point out how will that pattern generalize as we go up to a higher dimensionality of A and B. Um, but then we also, have, you know, but then we can also say things like, okay, well, what if what if we want to go up to more complex features? What if I want cubic terms in my features? Well, I could do very similar math, take this cubic stuff and go see what it maps into. And shockingly, and I'll leave this as an exercise for the reader, but the particular math, if you want to do the shortcut, you don't want to project into this, into these four dimensional space and you just want to do some sort of shortcut. Um, Again, I can do, it's, this is now all triple combinations of variables. Um, so I could also write it out that way. Um, that's just, turns out I could just instead compute a dot b and cube it instead of squaring it. 
Um, okay, that pattern, that's kind of cool. I can get a weird set of features. Um, I can make them more complicated, and the only thing I have to do is like change this exponent, which is a really, I mean, that's a pretty easy thing to change. It's not much more math to do cubed than squared. Um, but this is still kind of constraining that now I've got like all these cubic terms. What if I, you know, it's, it's still kind of weirdly constrained. Um, so, because I might also want simpler features in there. Anyway, are there other patterns that we can do? Uh, yes, it goes up to fourth and to fifth and to sixth and to any dimension you want. This pattern continues. Um, fine. What does this one do? So a dot b plus one squared. Um, I would not expect anyone to get that by an intuition. Um, what it turns out to be, and I'll show the math proof at the moment, is it's this set of features. It's the set of features that's not just all these squared terms, but it's also all the one, all the lower dimensional terms as well. So you also get all of the power of one terms, so x1 and x2, and you get all the power of zero terms. That's a little surprising. Um, if you want to work through what's happening there, I mean, again, it's it's just algebra. Just follow through and, and do the math. A dot B is just this A1, B1 plus A2, B2. And then if you actually expand out this squaring, multiply everything by everything else, you get this big long list of things, some of which are the same. So you can start collecting terms together and you can write it as 1 plus 2A1, B1, 2A2, B2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then once you've got it in that form, I can also go back over here and say, okay, well, if I did 5a dotted with 5b, what would that look like? Well, that would be this with a's in it, dotted with this with b's in it. Fine. And then if I do the dot product, which is multiply and add, multiply, the pairwise multiplies and add, I get exactly the same equation. So that's the, at least the evidence that this particular thing here turns into that. And yes, it generalizes to higher dimensions. If I go up to three dimensions, four dimensions, and five dimensions, it includes all of the lower order terms, um, including the one term. So we don't even have to add in that extra term, the bias term that we often did with the perceptrons. Um, in any case, we get, um, you know, and it keeps the original values as well. Um, so really, this is just sort of adding extra features, adding new features into um, into the space in the hopes that these higher order features um, will be ones that are going to help to draw a dividing line. OK. okay. Um, so we've got this interesting trick. It means that we can we sort of go back here a little bit. Um, when I'm doing this optimization, instead of doing all this math and doing these dot products, I can replace this phi's with that a dot b plus one. So I could take you know, x i or x i dotted with x j plus one, and then raise it to some power, and I can replace that component in there. And then everything else is all the same. I can go ahead and optimize with my alphas. Um, but I never actually have to compute these phi's, which is nice because, you know, if I raise these exponents up or if A and B are, you know, five dimensional 16 are, are, are vectors with a lot of elements in them, either way, that's going to make a giant list of features. And we're still going to effectively be using all those features, even though we never actually had to compute them. There's no approximation in anything I just did here. The, optima the optimal point must be the same. If I actually did do all of these expanding out to these features, the optimal point will be the same. Um, but I don't actually have to do it. We'll come back to that a few times because that's a, a very weird statement I just made. Before we go back to it, let's, let's see some examples. All right, let's use this data set. Um, all right. You draw a straight dividing line between those that separates things into the two categories. Um, let's try this with a one-dimensional. So I'm going to use d equals one. I'm just going to raise it to the power of one. 
that of course should be a straight line because it's d to the one. I'm not adding any new features in there. This is all still linear. Um, all right, this is more confirmation that yes, this didn't help whatsoever. I can find a straight line. It'll attempt to split things apart. Um, not going to do a great job of it. Let's do raising it to the power two. And so that's like, all I'm doing is, yeah, again, yeah. So let's raise it to the power two instead. Again, that's going to be a much higher dimensional space, but I never have to compute it. All I have to do is raise things to the power two instead. And I get this. Okay, well, it didn't really help at all. Um, it's a little better, maybe. Let's go to the power three. Again, I don't have to do any extra math. So I'm going to a much higher dimensional space here. But my math is still, all I have to do is a dot b plus 1 raised to the cubed instead of squared. And now it's going to be implicitly using some weird high dimensional space. And in that weird high dimensional space, there's a really nice dividing line that seems to separate these, these data sets. And we've got a nice small number of support vectors even, which is nice because in this alternate form, I'm not sort of computing omega. I need to, um, I just need to sort of uh, keep track of these alpha values of, of those particular, um, uh, of those particular data points that are right on the boundary line. So if they have alpha values that are non-zero. Um, cool. I can continue raising the exponent. Seems to still work nicely. Um, so adding more doesn't seem to hurt things. Although I get a little worried about what's happening down here. Something seems a bit strange. So what I'm going to do now is sort of zoom out on these plots. So right now these plots are sort of from minus 1.5 to 2.5 or minus 2 to 2, sort of in that range. I'm just going to zoom out and sort of grade plot, the, do exactly the same plot, but from like minus 4 to 4. All right. So yes, this straight line, it just continues. Fine. This graph is not a surprise. Um, this one here, zoom out a bit. Okay, you can start seeing that this curve starts to um, loop back on itself. It's going to eventually close. Yeah, fine. I mean, this is indicating that it's going to classify a point way the heck out here as red, and even this point down way over here as red. It should be fine. I mean, those are points that are w really outside. They're very dissimilar to what it was trained on, so it's not that as much of a surprise that it doesn't do a good job of or it's really hard. It's really hard to know what a good job of classifying out here would be. Um, so I guess that's not too bad. Um, it's like cubed one. This seems pretty good. It's a little weird that we're starting to get a really thin line out here. So it's like it's really sure that this point here is blue and this point over here is red. <laughs> um, and, there's, and there's sort of not much spacing in between there. Again, probably fine because just this is far away from the data it's it's trained on. And you should never expect an AI system to be particularly great about data that it's not trained, that's very dissimilar to what it was trained on. Um, and for this fourth one, ooh, well, that's a bit weird. We start getting, so one thing that ends up happening with high dimensional polynomial decision spaces is, yeah, I mean, we're still finding a straight line in that high dimensional polynomial space, but I can't visualize a ridiculous high dimensional polynomial space. Um, what a, what a, or in what a straight line up in that space is going to mean. What tends to happen is as you get this really sort of high degree is you start getting really weird boundaries that start doing things like this at obscure spaces. Again, great for data around where you're supposed to be. Some surprising things as we get farther out. Maybe it's an issue, maybe it's not. Um, we will see a trick like this that will be a little bit more well-behaved in that sort of regard. Um, but this is at least the sort of the, the first sort of step, simple step in this direction. Um, and hey, it's doing a really good job of classifying this data. I mean, we're still using the support vector machine, and we're just sort of implicitly doing this transformation into this high-dimensional space. Cool. Uh, oh, right. Uh, yes, we keep cranking this up. This is with degree 10. So this is, the exponent is just 10 up here. Fine. All right. And degree 20, we just start getting really weird boundaries. That's, that's really all I'm pointing out there. Um, and 
also maybe you're starting to get boundaries that are really tight and close. Um, because again, like it's finding the, the plane that is, or the hyperplane that is the, doing the best job of separating things in that high dimensional space. But things that are nearby in that high dimensional space aren't necessarily correspond to being sort of nearby in this lower dimensional space. Um, so people tend not to use this sort of polynomial trick for extremely high dimensions, um, but um, it can work really nicely in these sorts of lower dimensions. Um, or for data that is well suited to that particular high dimensional space. So, you know, it's worth trying, but often isn't what, what, what one wants. Okay, um, so that's, but that's just one possibility. Um, and I do want to highlight, uh, just sort of, so now that we've been interested, those functions that I was talking about, this sort of, instead of computing phi x i dotted with phi x j, I instead compute some function of x i and x j. Um, those functions are called kernels. Um, and as a terminology, this trick of, I'm just going to use the kernel instead of actually going to that high dimensional space is called the kernel trick. So those terminologies will come up. Um, there is tons and tons of valid functions that could be used here. Um, technically, so technically when you're building up that optimization problem in order to um, solve, where are we going? You know, as we're building up the solution to this optimization problem, when we turned it into something that we could pass to a quadratic programming thing, I had to, we have to compute this for every I and J and put it in a big matrix. Right. So that ended up being um, one of the steps. We had to, um, and the, so one constraint, so the situation where, hey, does this function act as something that is equivalent to going to some space and doing the dot product? Um, that happens if and only if this big matrix, which is the, calling that function on every single combination of points. So here the x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, that's all of my different data points. Um, and so I'm computing some function on every pair of data points. Okay. Um, so this big matrix that we build, um, the result of each of these things is going to be a scalar, because the dot product gives you a scalar, and this thing is supposed to do exactly the same thing as the dot product. Um, this big matrix, the constraint is that matrix has to be positive semi-definite. And I can never remember what exactly positive semi-definite means in terms of matrices. Um, but one really important feature that it definitely has to have is that it's symmetric. So if I call this function on x1 comma x2, I should get the same result as if I call it on x2 comma x1. All right. So I need that. So whatever function you're using has to have that constraint. Um, and one sort of rule of thumb is anything that's sort of acting as a distance measure or a similarity measure is going to work here. So if there's, um, uh, so any sort of function where, so a distance measure would be one where as X1 and X2 get farther and farther apart, um, the value K should increase and you know, maybe for x1 with itself, should be a small number, near zero maybe. Um, so that would be a distance measure. A similar linear measure would be the other way around. So x1 with itself would be sort of a maximum. And then as x2 gets farther and farther and farther away, um, then whatever this function is um, should decrease. Right, so those... Um, that's generally how we end up thinking about this, is it's some sort of distance or similarity measure. Um, fine. Um, let's, so I talked about a lot about that polynomial one. Um, there are a bunch of kernels out there. 95% of the time, though, this is the one that people are going to use. Um, and this is always the one that you should use first as just sort of an initial try. Um, and, um, and it's got some pretty nice properties as we'll sort of see. So here's the function I'm going to use as a distance measure. I'm just going to say, 
Euclidean distance between my data points because Euclidean distance is pretty good and we use it in lots of cases, lots of things. So I'm just going to compute the Euclidean distance between my points. Um, and then I'm going to turn it in, turn it into sort of um, a Gaussian blob. So I'm going to turn it into something that for two points that are right near each other, I'm going to get a value near one. And as the points get farther and farther away, it's going to drop down to zero. And we're just going to use the general Gaussian shape to do that. Um, so, you know, I compute my distance measure, and then I divide it by two sigma squared, and that's going to give me the, um, that's going to let me control how quickly it decays away to zero. Um, so that's the general sort of form of the writing it as a Gaussian. For some reason, historically, when people are using this with support vector machines, instead of using sigma as their variable, they just write it this way, and they just define gamma to be 1 over 2 sigma squared. Um, sure, um, I find this slightly more confusing, because I'm used to thinking about Gaussians in terms of sigma, but what this is saying is, as I increase gamma, that's the same as decreasing sigma, so that's going to mean that that it's going to be really quick to cause uh, our you know, points nearby are going to become I'm going to get I'm going to smaller value more readily. Um, but then if I have um, uh, a really small gamma, that's going to be the same as a very large sigma. So that's going to mean you're going to have to go fairly far away from this point before the similarity measure, this k value, um, actually drops off. Uh, or gets near closer to zero. Uh, okay, fine. Um, so that's the pre kernel function. But what um, what's the feature space that this corresponds to? So if I use this instead of transforming to some feature space and then doing the dot product, well, what feature space am I implicitly using? Um, and it turns out that this is the feature space. Or at least this is the, uh, in, in the one-dimensional case, this is the feature space. It's something similar in higher dimensions. Um, the um, so this is a feature space. Fine. Um, this is the first term. So fine. The first feature is some sort of e to minus gamma x squared. Okay. And then we have a second feature that's sort of multiply that by x. Another one that's multiplied by x squared by x cubed, but Hmm. This dot 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 keeps going forever. This is an infinite dimensional feature space. We're going to be doing our fitting if we use this particular function instead of transforming to some in, to instead of computing phi and then doing my support vector machine in this transformed space. If I instead use this kernel trick, I am implicitly using an infinite dimensional space and doing my support vector machine for fitting, find me the best line. It's finding me the best infinite dimensional hyperplane in this, I guess, infinite minus one dimensional hyperplane in this infinite dimensional space. That is weird. That is strange. Um, but that's what the math says. Um, we have an infinite number of features. Um, this is this goes by number. And so this is a Gaussian radial basis function. Um, Gaussian because it's Gaussian. Um, radial basis function because it's getting it's sort of the value is getting s smaller and sort of the circular blob um, um, around around our data point um, or, you know, based on the distance from one data point to another. Um, indeed, when people say radial basis function, they almost always mean the Gaussian one anyway, just because it's the default. And technically, you could use something else to turn distance into a value here, um, but Gaussian's pretty much the default. Um, if you want a little proof as to how, you know, why you should believe me when I say this acts the same as doing this dot product in infinite dimensional space, um, you, I'll at least, you know, I could show the, at least the beginnings of the proof. Um, for the special case where um, x is one-dimensional. Um, um, so again, if I do this substitution, I'm going to use a and b down here rather than x1 and x2. Um, but you know, this math here, if I write down what it's actually doing, um, is 
you know, if I if I take this squared and just sort of expand out those terms, I get a bunch of different terms. Um, because these are e to the whatever, and these things are being added together, I can split that into multiplying. Um, and I've got something with a squared, something with b squared, and then I've got this thing that is raised to the power of 2 gamma ab. Um, I can then take this e to the 2 gamma ab, and I can do the Taylor series expansion of that. Okay, and that's e to the something. You can just look up in the back of your textbook what the Taylor series expansion is of e to the something. Um, and it's this, you know, one something, you know, that something over one one um, factorial, that something squared over two factorial, that something cubed over three factorial, that's sort of the standard Taylor series expansion of e to the x. Um, and then once I've got it in this form, now you can see that I can sort of separate out each of these terms into a term that's dependent on a multiplied by a term dependent on b. All right. So this term here, I can split into these two terms. This term, I can split into these two terms. That term, I can split into these two terms. And now I've got something that is what, you know, this is exactly what you would get. This math here is exactly what you get if you took two different phi's, so phi of A and phi of B, did all this, and then took the dot product between those two things, right? The dot product between this for the a of this and the b version of this is 1.1, 1 .1, 2 gamma over 1 factorial a, oh, sorry, this bit here <laughs> just turns into, you know, gamma a squared and another one with b squared, fine. Um, this bit here is going to be this with an a multiplied by this with a b, yep. This with an a multiplied by this with a b, yep. Same sort of same sort of process that we went through in the previous um, proof over over here, right? We're actually just doing this multiplication out, and we end up getting the same result. Fine. Okay. So what? Why is does this? What does this actually do? Fine. The math looks pretty-ish, maybe. Um, what's it actually do? Okay, um, here's that same data, um, and I'm just going to give it to it, and I've got, um, I've got to choose a value for gamma, um, which is the same as choosing a value for sigma, um, so I'm choosing a sort of a default gamma of 1, um, which is the same as a sigma of like 0.7, or 1 over root 2, um, and I get this pretty little plot here. Okay, and this is this is is this is kind of nice. We get this nice sort of decision boundary going through our data points. We've got this sort of, you know, points nearby where sort of we know what we're going to classify as. Um, and we've got this very different sort of expanding out feature space rule we'll take a look a little bit more at here. Um, but let's first sort of okay, well, what happens if I play around with with this gamma parameter a little bit? So I can make it smaller, which is the same as making sigma bigger. So we should get more spreading, or we should be doing something like, you know, points have to get farther away from each other before I really consider them different. So and then we and we can sort of visually see that here that like, all right, we're sort of expanding out a little bit more in this space, and we're still classifying points out here the same as these, um, but we're getting you now we've got a slightly different set of support vectors. These points that are actually important, these points that have alpha be non-zero, um, that seems to work well. Um, we should probably also go the other way, and what happens if we increase gamma, same as decreasing sigma. We can increase it, that looks pretty good. And we increase it farther, that also looks pretty good. We can get these sorts of relatively interesting, oh, okay, no, it's gone ahead and learned some sort of interesting, you know, shape of this of this data. Okay. Um, and we have this nice side effect that it's representing that data, it's representing that shape with a fairly small number of parameters. It's just using these, the, the support vectors, the points that are highlighted here, the points in yellow and green, those are the only ones whose alphas are non-zero, so they're only the ones who matter when doing when doing this computation. Um, we're also seeing a bit of this weird new phenomenon where we've got this big empty space outside, 
um, that's all sort of giving me decision values near zero. Like if we had to, there'd be some line through here that actually says, oh, everything on this side of this line is positive and everything on this side of the line is negative. But actually we're getting a pretty large space where we've got values near zero. Um, and it seems to sort of correspond, it's, it's those spaces where almost, you know, like you'd be fine if the system just said, I'm not sure how I want to categorize that for a value near zero. Right? Um, and it seems to be doing that for sort of these points out in their edges. Let's confirm that that's happening for real by, again, zooming out on these graphs, plotting them over a wider range. And yeah, that's pretty consistent. Okay. Um, so if I ask this sort of system to classify a point way the heck outside the range, it's going to give me a decision value near zero. It won't be exactly zero, but it'll probably be near zero. Um, which may or may not be a useful feature, uh, but we get we get that sort of for free here. And the interesting question is like, why is this well, so well behaved? What why do we have that feature? What 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 the heck's going on here? Um, well, one way we can think of that is fine. Okay, well this is the kernel that we're using, but let's think about what that actually means in terms of the math going on to generate this figure. Because the math that's going on, well, so the standard support vector machine math is you take, you know, for each of these data points across this whole image, take its x value, do the dot product with omega, add b, and then that'll be the color. And then we're like, okay, fine, maybe we don't want to compute omega, especially if, if you know, um, but fine, if, if we don't want to compute omega, then we can expand things out, and then all we actually need to do is compute the dot product between x and xi, where xi is each of these support vectors, because again, those are the only values where, where alpha is non-zero. Okay. So we're doing the dot product between x and xi um, scaled by alpha and uh, yi. yi is a plus one for the things in one category and minus one for things in the other category. But that's what it was with sort of the original SVM. Now that we're doing this sort of weird alternate space, what we're actually doing is this is our decision boundary. You know, we don't, especially if if phi x is is if phi of x is infinite dimensional, well, that's going to mean that omega is infinite dimensional. Um, so we obviously can't compute omega, so we have to do it with this sort of this sort of form. Um, and instead of computing this dot product between two phi's, we've pointed out that the dot product between two phi's, given this particular weird space that we're using, is just e to the minus gamma x1 minus x2. So this is the math that I'm doing to generate this figure, or to classify any new data point that's coming in. Right, I'm just taking my new data point, computing this little function on it relative to every one of my support vectors. So that is these sorts of 10 points or 11 points, the green and yellow dots, the dots whose alphas are non-zero. All the other points, alpha zero, it's not going to affect anything in the sum. So I'm taking each of my points, doing, and then computing this sort of kernel on it, and this kernel is a Gaussian blob centered on the on our support vectors. So that means that this decision surface, this sort of this thing that I'm plotting, is by definition going to be the weighted sum of Gaussians centered on each of these yellow and green dots. That's what omega x plus b is going to be. Of course, we can't compute omega x plus b because in this particular case, well, it's going to be omega times phi x plus b. Um, we can't compute that because phi x or is infinite dimensional, um, and so omega is going to be infinite dimensional. We clearly can't work with that, but if we work it in this form, I get the same effect as that infinite dimensional space, but all I got to do is compute this this little exponential here. And I know from that, from that sort of way of thinking of it, that yeah, any point way the heck out here that's far away from any of those Gaussians, 
the weighted sum of those Gaussians is going to be zero or near zero because everything's going to decay away. <laughs> um, the standard thing, so that's kind of the cool result. Why we know that this sort of measure is going to lead to some sort of you know well-behaved behavior um, in in this sort of plot. Um, uh, that same argument is going to hold for pretty much any distance measure, but Gaussian is sort of the standard default that everyone uses. Okay, um, let's summarize that, um, and then in the next lecture we'll go on to some more applications and where we use this. Um, support vector machines. Um, so the original support vector machines that we talked about in the previous class, there's the equations for them. We are basically just trying to do find this optimization, xi's are our data points, yi's are the desired outputs, plus one or minus one, um, and we showed that you can turn it into this wacky form where all you need to do is so, you know, minimize this um, constraint with your alpha values being um, uh, either zero or positive. Um, and then once you've got that, um, in order to make a decision on a new data point, um, you can either go ahead and compute omega, or you can use it in this form where um, you take whatever your data points are who have a non-zero alpha, and I can do this sum on them. I feed in my new data point, do the dot product with xi, um, and yay, that'll give me a new, new decision. And that works fine. What we're then pointing out is fine, Well, that, but that works fine, but it's always going to do a linear boundary in x. We then pointed out, well, if you want a nonlinear boundary, we're going to need to go to some other dimensional space. So we're going to take x, transform it in some way, turn it into phi, uh, so phi of x. Um, all the math stays exactly the same, um, and this sort of is just going to be okay. I need the dot product between, instead of needing the dot product between xi and xj, now I need the dot product between phi of xi and phi of xj. All right, and same thing over here. All right, so that's just... I can still do, a, if I choose some high dimensional space and I go ahead and do that math and I go ahead and do these phi's, cool, I can go ahead and do that and apply a support vector machine in that higher dimensional space. And it's just the same as what we talked about in the previous class. It's just instead of using X as the raw data, I'm just going to compute some new things on X and add them into the, um, you know, add them into the matrix or add them into the vector and everything's all the same. But then the cool new trick that we're adding here is well, if you're going to go to this other dimensional space, there is an interesting shortcut. Because the only thing you need are these dot products, if you pick some other function, you pick some function, or whatever function you pick here, as long as it's a reasonable sort of similarity or distance measure, that's going to do the same job as projecting into some higher dimensional space and same optimization problem, same everything. It's still going to do, it's going to, going to find an optimal decision boundary in that high dimensional space, but I never actually have to compute phi. Instead, the only things I actually have to compute are, I need to compute this kernel function on each single pair um, of items. So that's, all right, I just need that. And when I do this decision case, I just need to do that substitution as well. I just need to compute the kernel there. Um, I'm still, the support, we're still finding the optimal plane in this high dimensional space, but I never actually create that high dimensional space. I never actually transform things into that high dimensional space, which means it's possible for that high dimensional space to be infinite dimensional. Um, and indeed it is for the um, Gaussian radial, uh, radial basis function. All right, um, great. Okay, the kernel trick is cool. Um, it We can use high, very high dimensional spaces without transforming the data, even infinite dimensional spaces. Um, we're still doing exactly the same theoretical idea as what we talked about in the previous class. Um, we're still maximizing this margin. Um, we will talk about this more next class, but um, as sort of a take-home message, in a lot of AI classification systems, this is what you want. Um, start with this. Try it out. This is the unsung workhorse of modern of, of AI. Um, often it doesn't even get called AI, just because it was sort of invented around the phase where AI wasn't a word that people applied to things. Um, uh, but 
large numbers of products that are out there that are doing some sort of classification on data. This is what they are doing. Um, we've got a little bit of open questions there. There are, there are still two free, two free parameters in what I've just described. So there's the gamma value for how big do you make um, that Gaussian blur. Um, and we also haven't talked much about C, which is the cost of how bad is it for a data point to violate the boundary. Um, but that's only two parameters to optimize, and we will talk about doing that process in the next class. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much, and uh, we will continue to explore these kernels in the next lecture. Get it.